This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. That really wonderful TV year, 1984. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. So I've collected TV Guide fall preview issues over the years, and I thought it would be fun to talk about which shows made it, which didn't, and which ones we actually watched. Right. And I have to give credit to Ken Reed's TV Guidance Counselor podcast for this idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, We previously did 1982. We're skipping 83 because I don't have the issue. I guess it's because I was in college at the time and I didn't get around to picking it up. Oh my gosh. I'm missing that issue. eBay, here we come. Cable begins to be a presence in the guide by this point. And while most of it is reruns and repurposed programming, there are two notable premieres. Still the Beaver was a TV reunion movie on the Disney Channel, which would lead to a new series imaginatively called the new Leave it to Beaver. Good Sex with Dr. Ruth Westheimer introduced the therapist to a large audience and led to many appearances on NBC's Letterman Show. We also had what TV Guide called Early Starters, shows that already came on the air since the previous Fall Deluge, several of which did very well. CBS's Airwolf starred Ernest Borgnine and Jane Michael Vincent as pilots of a super helicopter, Shades of Knight Rider. The chopper could go at supersonic speeds, had major armaments. It was actually a dark Cold War parable in its first year, but CBS wanted to make it more family friendly, so it quickly got silly. The show ran for three seasons on on CBS and then moved to USA for a final year with a new cast and a much smaller budget. (laughs) In that season, all the in-flight shots of the copter were reused from previous seasons. There was no new footage. Now, this was Donald B. Pelissario's second big series after Magnum Mm P.I. Of course, he would go on to Quantum Leap and, more importantly, the JAG NCIS franchise. ABC's Follow Ups, Bleeps, and Blunders was a response to another early starter, NBC's TV's Bloopers and Practical Jokes. The former starred Steve Lawrence and Don Rickles, while the better known latter starred Dick Clark and Ed McMahon. Both were basically the same show with two parts. Bloopers from TV shows, which up to that point were rarely seen outside of end of season party reels for the cast, and wacky stunts and jokes played on celebrities with hidden cameras. NBC's version ran on NBC in various guises for 14 years, then on to ABC for 9 years, then in syndication in the 2010s. ABC's version ran for two short seasons and disappeared, but they did broadcast the infamous Star Trek blooper reel for the first time. Today, of course, TV and film bloopers are all over the internet. The practical joke TV show concept goes back to candid camera and would eventually spawn shows such as Punked. ABC's Call to Glory was a family drama set in the days of the Cold War with an Air Force theme. Craig T. Nelson stars as a pilot and father to three kids with wife Cindy Pickett and grandfather Keenan Wynn. A young Elizabeth Shue played the daughter. Nelson would go on to the long-running sitcom Coach. The show only lasted one season. So far, the shows we've talked about, I didn't really watch. And Mm. that might have been part and parcel with me being in college then. Yeah. Next show, Kate and Allie, was a major hit for CBS and one of the first shows with two independent divorced women who weren't desperately trying to find a new guy. Susan St. James and Jane Curtin starred with their TV kids, Ari Myers, Allison Smith, and Frederick Kaler. The show was originally only given six episodes, a rarity at the time, but standard operating procedure today. Then the show became an immediate hit, running six seasons and hitting the top 20 for the first four of them. There was even a spinoff called Roxy, starring SCTV's Andrea Martin, but it only lasted two episodes. Kate and Allie was shot in New York, also a rarity at that time, in order to allow James to work without relocating her family to L.A. At one point, the show was taped at the Ed Sullivan Theater, now the home of Stephen Colbert. The network made sure that viewers saw the leads going into separate bedrooms in order to avoid impressions that they were lesbians. Jane Curtin, previously on the original SNL, would go on to Third Rock from the Sun. Susan St. James already had a long career from Name of the Game and an Emmy to Macmillan and Wife. She essentially retired after this series, and that is one I watched all the time. (laughs) As did I. 
And another one I watched a lot is NBC's Night Court, which was created by Reinhold Wieg, known for his work on Barney Miller. Idea is similar, with a rundown courtroom instead of a rundown police station. It's also similar to Law & Order in that there were a number of cast changes. <laughs> the only constants were Judge Harry Stone, Harry Anderson, whom the show was built around, Prosecutor Dan Fielding, John Larroquette, and Bailiff Bull Shannon, Richard Mall. Harry was an amateur magician, of course Anderson was a comedy magician in real life, and brought maybe too much levity to the courtroom, while Dan was a narcissist and Lothario, and Bull was slow-witted and also very innocent. There were four different public defenders throughout the run of the series, Gail Strickland in the pilot, Paula Kelly in season one, Ellen Foley in season two, and Marky Post for the rest of the series, and by far the best remembered one. I don't know if I remember any of the other ones. I don't know if they're even in the syndication package. Yeah. There were two court clerks, uh, Karen Austin in season one, and Charles Robinson for the rest of the series, and then there were also three female bailiffs, Selma Diamond, seasons one and two, Florence Halop, season three, and Marsha Warfield for the rest of the series. Diamond and Halop actually died during the show's run, and that's why they made the move to a younger character. I'm not sure I would have taken that job, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, that was taken over by Warfield. Uh, there were a large number of recurring characters during the show's run. John Aston played Harry's insane father. Mel Torme played himself, because Harry was a huge fan. TNG's Brent Spiner played an Appalachian yokel. Florence Stanley was a fill-in judge. Now, she played the same character on My Two Dads. Ah. The show ran for nine seasons in the top 20 for three of them and won seven Emmys out of 31 nominations. John Larroquette won four of them in a row, which is still a record, and then withdrew his name for future consideration. He was tired of winning. Which is what people should do when they've won yes. more than two for the same role. Yes, he won four in a row. Anderson would go on to sitcom Dave's World, and Post went on to sitcom Hearts of Fire with John Ritter, and Warfield went on to Empty Nest. Larroquette got his own eponymous sitcom, then a regular role on the practice Boston legal concept, and he's now on The Librarians. He's won five Emmys and a Tony so far. And not to mention he had a sitcom that was canceled this year. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that came and went. Yeah. Anderson, Post, and Robinson played themselves in a fake reunion <laughs> on an episode of 30 Rock. <laughs> NBC's Riptide is a Stephen J. Cannell creation, which at that point meant lighthearted detectives. Perry King and Joe Penny are ex-Army buddies who start a PI business in L.A. They bring in a tech guy, probably one of the first nerd regulars on such a show, played by Them Bray to do computer stuff. They also have a helicopter and a speedboat, which figure heavily into the series. Of course, setting a series in a marina means a lot of girls in bikinis. Partly because of this, the show ran for three seasons. Joe Penny would later become Jake to William Conrad's Fat Man. Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer had been attempted before as a TV series in 1958 with a young Darren McGavin. Now Stacey Keach gets the title role as the Private Dick with Lindsay Bloom as his secretary. Despite the show being set in then current times, there was a lot of film noir influences as well as politically incorrect attitudes from the lead. Most of the bad guys would be shot and killed by Hammer by the end of the wow. episode. The show was later called The New Mike Hammer during its three season run, including TV movies and specials. Now, on to the actual fall shows. Oh my gosh, we haven't even hit the <laughs> actual hit... fall shows yet. Starting on Saturday. Partners in Crime on NBC. Another of those fill-in-the-blank returns to TV series. Linda Carter from Wonder Woman and Lonnie Anderson from WKRP in Cincinnati co-star as ex-wives of a private detective who dies, bequeathing his agency to them. Their first case is his murder. Linda plays a former socialite who lost her money, and Lonnie plays the daughter of a con man. They are both struggling in their current jobs, photographer and cello player, respectively. So they give the detective biz a go. Despite their lack of money, they have plenty of access to glamorous fashions. The names of their characters, Carol Stanwyck and Sidney Kovac, are clearly plays on film noir actors. Ellen Heckert plays their ex-husband's mother. The show lasted all of 13 episodes. It was produced by Johnny Carson's production company, which meant it got an automatic time slot. Linda went into the series Hawkeye and a lot of TV movies and guest spots, while Lonnie went on to the series Easy Street and Nurses. 
Finder of Lost Loves on ABC starred Tony Franciosa, who ran a pre-internet misconnection service, who brought together old flames. Deborah Dare played his assistant. This is similar in concept to Love Boat or Fantasy Island. It's an anthology series with an ongoing cast and guest stars doing the heavy lifting, and was also produced by Aaron Spelling. Spelling's golden touch didn't work this time, one season and done. It did end up as a riff on MST3K, with confusion over whether Tony Franciosa or James Franciscus played the lead. Franciosa had already had leading roles on Valentine's Day, Name of the Game, Search, and Matt Helm. Cover Up on CBS stars Jennifer O'Neill as a fashion photographer whose husband is killed. She then learns he was a CIA agent, so the logical thing to do is hire model John Eric Hexum to help find the killer. The CIA is impressed with her initiative and offers her a job. They would still be photographer and model, just with a side business of being secret agents. This short-run series, one season and done, is mostly remembered for a terrible accident. Hexum was playing with a prop gun during break between scenes, which he thought was unloaded. Turned out the blank was powerful enough to give him massive skull damage at close range, putting him on life support before he was declared brain dead. A new assistant was hired, played by Anthony Hamilton, but the show was soon gone. Jennifer O'Neill had previously starred on soap Bare Essence and was a lead in the film Summer of 42, but was best known as a model. Hot Pursuit on NBC is basically the fugitive with a husband and wife on the run. The couple is played by Carrie Keene and Eric Pierpoint. She is framed for murdering her boss and he breaks her out of prison. Turns out the boss's wife, Dina Merrill, orchestrated the whole thing. Seems more like a TV movie than a series, which mm -hmm. is probably why it only lasted 12 episodes. Uh, Eric Pierpoint would go on to play George Francisco on the Alien Nation TV series, as well as Fame, Silk Stockings, and Heart of Dixie TV series, as well as the Star Trek TV franchise. He was on all the modern Star Trek series wow. in guest roles. Dina Merrill had a long film and a TV career, but this was her only regular TV role. Well, that kind of surprises me. Yeah. Hmm. Moving on to Sunday. Punky Brewster. What a cheery premise. Adorable Moppet, Salil Moonfry, is abandoned in Chicago and found by crusty landlord George Gaines. Will they get along? Will he do the legal thing and hand Punky off to social workers? Of course not. He fights to legally adopt her and does so. The show ran for two seasons on NBC, the highest rated primetime show for girls 2 to 11. <laughs> then ran in syndication for another year. Since the show ran on Sundays early in the evening, it was often impacted by NFL games. The solution was to shoot a set of 15-minute episodes to fit the tight schedule. The character name was provided by NBC chief Brandon Tartikoff, based on a childhood crush. Punky's dog was named Brandon. How sweet! <laughs> the show would generate a Saturday morning cartoon called It's Punky Brewster! Salil so Moonfry went on to a regular role on Sabrina the Teenage Witch and a lot of voice work. George Gaines played the Commandant in the Police Academy movies and was in the Days and Nights of Molly Dodd, Hearts of Fire, and General Hospital. Murder, She Wrote on CBS was a long-running detective series starring Dame Angela Lansbury. She plays Jessica Fletcher, a mystery writer who happens to be around when dead bodies are found, so she figures out who done it. Obviously, she did. She's the only common point among the episodes. Obviously. Obviously. Jessica was a mass murderer. Exactly. Despite the simple premise, local cops are stumped, Jessica glides in and solves the case. It became an enormous international hit, hitting the top ten in the Nielsen's for eight of its twelve seasons. A series of TV movies followed, which ran into the 2000s. Several backdoor pilots were attempted, which, with one of them succeeding, starring eventual Law & Order stalwart Jerry Orbach, called The Law and Harry McGraw. Tom Bosley played the local sheriff in town, who eventually retires, and then he starred in a similar NBC series called The Father Dowling Mysteries. Lansbury's career is legendary. You have Gaslight, Picture of Dorian Gray, Manchurian Candidate, Broadway's Mame and Sweeney Todd. She's got five Tonys, a Grammy, an honorary Oscar, six Golden Globes, and 18 Emmy nominations, including for every year of Murder, She Wrote. But she never won She's one. She's never won one. Wow. Mark, stop. Wait. There's just too many shows to talk about at one time here. I suppose you're right. I think we have to take a break. Okay. So, 
you can check out the second part of this episode in a couple weeks. In the meantime, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife Treat Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. <laughs>